Hey everybody, welcome back to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to continue looking at our NRF52 example layout. So in the previous video, we looked at some of the front end tasks that are needed to prepare to work with this type of component. So the NRF52 part number that we're working with is a fine pitch BGA. There are a couple of things we need to do in the layer stack, and then we set up some vias so that we can actually route into that fine pitch BGA and ensure that we don't have any problems with clearances. So I'm gonna show you in this video what the layout is looking like. So make sure to follow along in your own copy of All Team Designer. Let's get started. So I'm back here inside of the layout in All Team Designer and I've got all of the components placed. So everything that was in that one schematic is now on the PCB. I haven't even set the board size yet. As you can see, I'm still in the default size for the PCB. I've still got the origin over here. But for now, I've just went ahead and placed everything in a preliminary placement. And what we're gonna do is run over some of the routing channels that we can plan out in this board. So here you can see I've already got my debug header placed. And then I have another header here that's connecting on to this component. And then I have my regulators and my EEPROM over here in this area. Here I've got my two reference clocks that are pretty close to these pins on the NRF. My reference clock is set over here. And then I have another reference oscillator over here that connects over to these two pins on the NRF. Those are most of the components that we need to worry about. We've got a set of capacitors over here as well. All of that is gonna be for power decoupling and for bypass. And then the last piece here is just how we plan out those routing channels into the inner layer. So here in the BGA, I've already got the fan out set. I didn't put any vias on these pins because right now in this layout, these pins are unassigned. And so because of that, I didn't really think it was necessary to put anything on that particular set of pins here that are unassigned to any nets. But for the rest of these pins, you can see that there's already vias set on here. So you can kind of tell because the, uh, the text here on these pins is overlapping a little bit. So here what I have on the top layer is, of course, I'm gonna route directly in to these pins on the top layer. Then on L2, you can see we've got our blind vias going from the top layer to the mid layer. These blind vias have been lined up here and then um, here over on this row as well. The next thing that we have is going on to L3, we only have this set of blind vias. This set of blind vias contains a set of 20 ground pins plus these additional two ground pins. So there's a total of 22 of them. Um, you can see them all right here. Now all of these ground pins are gonna connect to the same net, of course, and what they can do is they can all connect to polygon fill on this layer. So after we do the routing into these pins, and then these pins on L3, we can essentially do polygon pour, and that's going to provide a ground plane for any of the signals routing in on this layer. And then we're going to have the rest of our signals routing in on this top layer. So this presents a little bit of a challenge because normally we would like to have those pins separated by ground as much as we can. And this is one of those components that's a bit challenging because of the way that you have to set those blind and buried vias in this design, you don't really have any room to place ground unless you were able to then use very thin laminates. So suppose you could use two mil laminates and you had that available, so like on a, on a reinforced PTFE laminate, you could then put a two mil laminate and then you could have blind vias going to the next layer and then you could separate those with ground. For this case, it's not really gonna be so critical because most of these are slow signals. So here, just as an example, we have some IOs. We have ground and VDD coming into this second row. Here up on this top row, we just have some indicators and then we have some other nets that'll route over to another component, again, just as IOs. Similarly, over here, we have the same kind of thing. So here we have our SCL and then our SWD clock. This is just gonna go over to the debug header. And then you see on the next row, we don't really have any pins that are going to be considered very high speed. So if we were dealing with a bunch of high speed stuff coming into these multiple pins like this, we would then have an issue because we would wanna make sure that we try to separate those by ground if we can. In this particular case, we're not so worried about it because we're not dealing with a lot of high speed digital. The next thing, where's the antenna gonna be? Looking at this component, the antenna is not obvious unless you were to cross probe back to the schematic. So if we just take a look at the schematic for just a second, and I zoom in over here, you can see that E1 is our output to our antenna. So it goes over to this Pi filter, and then the output of that Pi filter goes to an antenna. So on E1 right here, 
I've actually placed all of those components for that pie filter, and then our antenna is gonna come out like this. So that's really important because this antenna could then come out and then go to like an inverted F, or it could go to just a simple trace antenna, like a microstrip antenna on the top layer. So we wanna make sure that when we actually set up the antenna routing in another video, we'll then set that up to the appropriate impedance, we'll do feed line matching right here, and then we'll have the actual antenna element over here in this region. So what we need to do is make sure that we either use a keep out or, polygon, uh, or a polygon cutout, or better yet, both, in order to ensure that we have space around this antenna for it to operate as intended. This antenna is gonna be routed as a coplanar waveguide, and we're gonna hold off on routing the antenna in this video. But the reason that we would wanna route it as a coplanar waveguide is so that, of course, we're gonna be able to put ground around it so we can set the impedance to a required value, and then we'll have room to put some vias around it so that way we can provide some shielding from any of the other components in this layout. So the other thing about this output here for this antenna is you see we've got this capacitor here. Now this capacitor connects over to this pin. We could theoretically put it over here or somewhere else because we can just route the trace off of that pin coming right over here and then any of those traces coming from this row over to this region, we could then route up to the top layer through through hole vias. So one thing we didn't look at in the previous video is how are we gonna place through hole vias? So the through hole vias of course need to be sized for mechanical drilling. So for that, we would wanna do something like an eight or a 10 mil drill, and then we would wanna set the pad size to hit our IPC class definition. So if we're just going for class two, we could use an eight and 16 mil via. So that would be an eight mil diameter and then a 16 mil pad. To do that, you could of course set that up just by grabbing a via and throw it in here just for the moment. You can grab this via, go into the properties panel, and then change the diameter. I think probably the easiest way to do this is to actually set this up in the design rules as a preferred via size. And then that way, anytime you grab that via tool off of the top bar here, it's then going to select that via size automatically. Then once you place it in the layout, you can change it if you need to. You don't have to change it at all if you don't want to. So here, we can just route in directly. First, of course, make sure that this via is set to the correct net. So I didn't do that when I placed it. Make sure it's set to the correct net. And then just grab this guy over, route this guy on the inner layer over to here. Now, we can just keep doing this for all these other signals. So there's plenty of signals to route out here. And of course, I can just grab this, place it over here. If I want to, I can assign this to a net and then course, I can start routing it out. Now, as we go through this exercise, um, you could also place a via wall routing. There is a hotkey to be able to do that. You don't have to, of course, do it manually by hand for each one of these. So make sure that you check out the hotkeys to be able to do that. So let's just say, for example, we want to route this SDA net. Well, what we can do is first, we'll start the routing tool, and then we can hit the layer change key to go to a new layer. And then once we go to that new layer, let's say we wanna to go to layer three, we would then hit the six key to cycle through the different types of vias that are available on that particular layer. So in this case, I would wanna do a through hole to get into the inner layer outside of the BGA. So that's exactly what we'll do. And now that I'm on layer three, what I can do is just kind of complete this route like this and come in and touch that pin and that route is completed. And so we can go through and we can do this process for all of the other pins that are in this footprint. So just as an example, you know, I have V-read right here. For V-read, it makes sense maybe to move this back just a little bit, and then we can start the routing tool, and this one we can actually go straight in. And then here, let's say for C11, we could do the same kind of thing. I think for V-read, it's easier to maybe rotate it like this, and then grab that track, delete anything that's left over, and then start grabbing some of these other traces and routing straight in. Here for C5, we can also do the same thing. We can just route straight in. For VDD, we could also route straight in, but I think for VDD, it's gonna be better to use some larger rails, and that would especially be the case if we had other components on the board that needed to draw a lot of power at high speed. In this case, we only have the one, so we're not so worried about it. So as you go through this, you can go ahead and complete all of those routes kind of in the same way. That will allow us to very quickly set up this board and get it ready for the RF section. I'm gonna go through and do a little bit more of the routing and we'll get it closer. And as we get it closer, we'll then be able to see where we can have some room to lay out the RF section. 
So I've got a couple more of the nets routed, and then one thing I start to notice here as I'm going through this is that we're gonna have to place the antenna feed line here, but then we're gonna have to place ground around it. And so some of this stuff with C9 is a little close for comfort in my opinion. So what I might wanna do is put this on the back layer, but it would be the only component on the back layer, so I don't think it makes sense. Maybe a better strategy is maybe to move it over into this region, because if you look here, the other connection for C9 is right here. Maybe you can get a trace to come over into this direction over here. That will let you move this component over there. So just as an example, you no, know, maybe I can put it like right here and maybe I can make some space with these guys since they haven't been fully routed yet. So if I just take this trace, straighten it out, move this one down just a bit, might be able to make some room for this so that we don't interfere with this other component. But you can see here, I keep triggering the rules error as I keep making that move. And now I'm finally out of that clearance limitation. Maybe I can rotate it around like this and then make some room for it. So now that I've got it like this, you can see from on L2, that now I can probably fit my via right here in this area and then route into C9. So if I just take this, cut it, I can move it over, make a little bit more room like this. And then I think from that, I'll be able to actually make that route. So just going through this kind of tight layout like this, one thing that you do wanna be careful of, as I've been mentioning, is that you're gonna to have to have ground around this feed line. And with this layout being really dense like this, it can be tough to do that. So don't be afraid to move some of these components around and compromise on your placement because honestly, with this layout, you might not have a choice. And we also wanna make sure that we don't put anything down here in this area because this area is where the antenna is actually going to sit and it will actually just be a microstrip antenna. So that's gonna be really simple for us to place. It's something that we could copy right out of the reference design. There are also a lot of guides online to building a microstrip antenna that will be able to interface with this particular matching network. And then that'll give us a nice clean way to route this signal in and then place it on this board. So I'm gonna keep going through this uh, after we're done filming. This is gonna be a fun one once we get to the stage where we can place the antenna. So make sure to tune into our next video. We'll have more of this layout done. We'll at least have all of these signal lines routed and then we can start to place the antenna. Then we'll worry about putting the ground cut out around it so that way we can set the impedance to the right value. And then I think we'll be able to wrap it up with some ground pour and then the power rails. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and make sure, of course, to get your own copy of Alting Designer and follow along with these tutorials and tune into part three so that you can see how we finish up this PCB layout. All right, thanks everybody for watching. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.